Well, good morning, church, and uh, welcome to another in our series about the life of Nehemiah. Uh, our series is called Building for the Future, and today my topic is teamwork. Teamwork. There's a lot about teamwork in chapter 3 of Nehemiah. You know, there's lots of things that we can do to foster teamwork. And one of the things that I've uh, done to help uh, teamwork happen as part of this series is I've uh, written this particular book, uh, Nehemiah Building for the Future. And there's quite a number of people are using this in their personal quiet times and or in their small group Bible studies. But the thing is, when you're on the same page and you're moving together, uh, it just vision seems to, to start to happen more naturally. And so the idea is for people to listen to the preached Word of God uh, reflect upon the various passages through the study booklet and or also discuss the study book in their personal uh, small group meetings. And so you've got three things. Um, the preached Word of God, meditating on the passages in your personal quiet times and finally discussing it in your small groups. And uh, when that sort of thing happens, often teams are strengthened because you're on the same page, you're moving together in the same direction. There's a lot about teamwork actually in the Bible in general. Um, one of the Apostle Paul's favorite phrases for team players was fellow worker. He used that quite a lot. Let me look at uh, one particular example, Philemon 1.1. 1, 1. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. There it is, fellow worker. Now, fellow worker is translated from the Greek word synergos. And synergos, I'm sure you've jumped to the conclusion immediately, we get our word synergy from it, which of course is, is really about teamwork. Uh, synergy, the interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements. So in other words, um, a team of three plus three plus three, the output should be about nine, but if strong synergy is taking place, the output might be 20. Of course, the opposite is true too. We were at a conference a number of us uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that uh, was mentioned by uh, Craig Grishel, uh, uh was that, um, of course, the opposite can be true too. If you've got a toxic member on your team, your output is limited. So three plus three plus three might only equal five. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. Let me illustrate this with some pencils. I wonder if I could call on someone to break some stuff. That's always fun, isn't it? Um, perhaps, Jared, if you could come down and break some things for me. Got a few pencils here. Um, yeah, well, let, let's start with one. That won't be a problem, will it? Uh, thanks, Jared. So we've got a pencil here. I wonder if you'd um, be happy to break this for me. No problem. Um, let's throw it up there, I guess. Or how about three? No problem at all. Looking good. Let's uh, let's up it a bit. And uh, how about twenty pencils? You've got to break them all at once in the one handful. Yeah. Bit more difficult. A bit more difficult. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> my my point is this, friends. That um, you see when. You've got synergy really happening. Uh, it's pretty hard to break teams. You know, it's one thing to break an individual out by themselves or perhaps a small team where not a lot of synergy is taking place. But when you've got a team with real synergy, you know, a group of, like I was giving the illustration of three plus three plus three might have an output of like 20 and they are difficult to break as a team. And this is exactly what we're going to find in this chapter, that Nehemiah establishes such effective teamwork that when they come under opposition, those teams are not easily broken. Now, Jerusalem, just to give you a little bit of uh, background, you know, back before the Babylonians had destroyed it, it was considered at that time a large city. And because many roads converged there, many of them coming internationally, it required many gates. The wall on each side of these heavy wooden gates was taller and thicker so soldiers could stand guard to defend the gates against attack. Sometimes two stone towers guarded the gate. In times of peace, the city gates were hubs of activity. City council was held there and shopkeepers set up their wares at the entrance. Building the city walls and gates was not only a military priority, but it would become a boost for trade and commerce and ultimately would help establish the nation of Jews as a worshipping community. So they were extremely important. Um, now, there is um, some actual excavated sites of the original wall of Nehemiah. Perhaps we might have a look at one of these. 
Uh, so this is believed by archaeologists to be the actual wall. So this is two and a half thousand years old. It's been unearthed, and, and there it is, you know, parts of the original Nehemiah wall. Of course, um, it didn't look like that when it was, was completed. <laughs> In fact, this was probably a little bit more like what Nehemiah stumbled across, more like uh, ruins. But Nehemiah has in his mind uh, something completely different. He wants to establish something like this. And this is very much what he's going to construct. Uh, you can see the very high walls there and the gates in between. And uh, the, these, these are actually pretty substantial structures. Uh, the, uh, the walls were an average of about 12 meters high and 2.5 meters thick. And that was so soldiers could actually stand on, on top of the walls. And the circumference is four kilometers. So they've got four kilometers worth of that wall to build. And they know opposition is very likely, and so they need to build it quickly. Let's have a look here at perhaps an overhead map of the wall. Um, here we can see the various gates listed. And um, Nehemiah does this all very logically as he records it. He, um, he starts right up the top here at the sheep gate, works his way around to the fish gate, the old gate, the broad walls mentioned, and, and all the way down to the valley gate, down to the dung gate, fountain gate and, and then works his way all the way back up describing the rebuilding of the wall so that's that's a journey we're going to go on today and one of the things i will mention is i will not uh, highlight every verse it's actually quite a long chapter it's about the same length as the previous two chapters combined so i will just select a few key verses as we journey through this but there is lots to learn about teamwork from this chapter so let, let's look at the first verse nehemiah 3 1 it says, Elijah the high priest and his fellow priests went to work. Now you've got to picture this for a moment. Remember the nation were used to priests wearing the priestly robes, very fine attire. They wore a breastplate with 12 gemstones, and many of them quite expensive ones. So they were finely attired gentlemen with a very responsible role. All manner of sacrifices were offered to the Lord as part of their worship. Uh, they would share the Word of God, read the Word of God, as well as preach the Word of God. They were available to counsel about spiritual matters, and uh, they were men of prayer and uh, men of worship. You know, um, And here they are, that's what people's used to. And here these blokes, what are they doing? They're going to be getting a bunch of bricks, chunky stones, etc., and they're going to get the job done, getting these all mounted around walls and that sort of stuff, and they're the very first ones mentioned. The priests, you know, isn't that interesting? Well, friends, I learned this from them. Spiritual leaders should set the example of teamwork. Spiritual leaders should set the example of teamwork. You know, um, <laughs> I still remember this guy. There's a, there a chap who's visiting one of my old churches years ago, and... Um, he wanted to go out for a coffee. He'd been along for several weeks. And we sat down and had a coffee together. And as we were talking for a while, he, 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 um, he mentioned that what he'd like to do in the church is he would like to be the chairman of a board. And uh, I said to him, well, what sort of board? And he said, oh, I don't mind any sort of board. I'm happy to, you know, that's what I'd like to do. I don't know if he needed that on a resume or something. Who knows? But um, as we chatted further, I asked him about, well, what did you how did you want to be involved in serving God in the church? Mentioned a few things. He said, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I just want to be the chairman of a board. And um, what we realize here is, you might say, the opposite of what we see with these priests. You know, uh, they, they, they're willing to get in there and get the job done, uh, get their hands dirty, set the example of teamwork. Uh, this chap, really, he was all about, he wanted to be a leader, but didn't want to do anything. <laughs> Jesus is the opposite of this, isn't it? You think of Jesus, his servant leadership. Jesus was very much a strong leader. I mean, what he said definitely went, but did Jesus ever ask his disciples to do anything that he hadn't already done? Never. Yes, he wanted them to go out and preach the gospel and their lives could be threatened by this, they could be persecuted, but he'd already done that. Yes, he wanted them to lay hands on people with leprosy, which people were so frightened of, so much stigma attached to leprosy, and yet he wanted them to lay hands on lepers and pray for them as sick people. But he'd already done that. 
You see what I mean? He's a servant leader. He never asked people to do what he wouldn't do himself, even though he was very much the leader. Well, you know, I think these priests are a great example here. Spiritual leaders should set the example of teamwork. Let's read the whole verse. It says, Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. Now, when you heard the word sheep gate, which is up the top mentioned, um, I know that probably what might spring to mind is, oh, okay, that's, that's the gate for the livestock, you know, cattle, sheep, poultry, and so on. And that's where the animals will be brought in for the markets and that sort of stuff. Uh, no, it's not that. The sheep gate was specifically for the perfect lambs without blemish to be offered as a sacrifice. So actually, really, this is a sacred gate. Nearby the temple, you go through that gate and the temple's kind of the next major building you encounter. I find it interesting that Nehemiah clearly saw this as the highest priority. Get this built first. I learned this lesson from him. That Nehemiah was a man who made worship a priority. Can I suggest this? Number two. When worship is given priority, teams function better. When worship is given priority, teams function better. Why? Well, we get our eyes heavenward. Off perhaps some of the, the problems and issues, get our eyes on the Lord. Teams function better when we're people of worship. I mean, there's interesting analogies in there, isn't there? Of course, those sacrifices pointed to Jesus as the perfect lamb without blemish. And that gate, of course, uh, where those lambs are going to be brought through. Remember one occasion in the New Testament, Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the way to salvation. And of course, those lambs, we might even say that gate is an analogy for us looking forward to the coming Messiah who would die for the sins of humanity. Let's jump down to verse 5. 3 5, it says, The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Uh, this is interesting. Now, the people of Tekoa were working, but not their nobles. Now, you might come to the conclusion well, Tekoa was about 20 kilometers away from Jerusalem. It's not going to be protected by the walls anyway. So the nobles might have thought, well, why bother? Although I don't really think that was the reason. And, and I say that because lots of people working on the walls were from towns outside of the walls of Jerusalem, yet didn't stop them working. I think more likely they just saw themselves as nobles and menial work, menial tasks were beneath them. But the thing I find interesting about this is you don't see Nehemiah, you know, inviting them out for a, for a meal to have a chat with them and try and bring them around. He doesn't bother to do that at all. In fact, I want to suggest that Nehemiah was too busy working with the people who were keen to do the work to bother with these people who didn't want to be involved. You know, see, no matter how good the vision is or how effective the leadership, not everyone will get involved. Nehemiah knew that. He kept his focus where it needed to be on the people who were keen. Can I suggest this? Number three. Effective team leaders have realistic expectations. Effective team leaders have realistic expectations. He knew not everyone would get behind the vision. Look at verse 8. It says, Aziel, the son of Hariha, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. These are an in interesting couple of guys to be mentioned. We've got a goldsmith. Um, skilled in the art of creating jewellery and other, uh, other things in, in gold. Now, this guy could have said, oh, well, you know, I, I can't be repairing the wall. You know, I need to be creating uh, golden bowls for worship and that sort of thing for the temple. But no, he, he didn't say that. Well, the perfume maker, I did a little bit of research on perfume makers in the Scriptures. All the other ones I could find are all women. But this chap is a bloke, perfume maker. And by the way, these trades 
being the art of uh, crafting gold or making perfume were quite big money things. I don't think these guys were particularly skilled in laying bricks or stones. But what do we see? They got in there and they got the job done. No, perhaps their skill levels were not high in this area. Perhaps they weren't passionate about laying bricks. In fact, more than that, it might have been something they found pretty difficult. But they did it anyway. Why did they do it? Because they knew that was what was needed at the time. Can I make this suggestion? Good teamwork may require people to operate outside of their area of gifting. Good teamwork may require people to operate outside of their area of gifting. Now, one of the things is, because um, we're always hearing the other, you know, you know, operate within your gifts. But I see if you have a good look at Scripture, you'll see both. Yep, people operating within their gifting, but also people doing stuff that just, it needs to be done. The job needs to be done. Now, I'm not a very um, practical person, practical skills. I've got a brother, John. John is insanely gifted at practical stuff. Ken and I never got those gifts. Um, but, uh, you know, John, John's an electrician by trade, worked for Telstra for many, many years. Um, but he can just turn his hand to things. Mechanical stuff with his car, he'd mostly fix it himself. You know, um, and he, he, he drives, he's got this big old Land Cruiser, which I don't think will ever stop running because he just keeps it on the road, keeps fixing it. Um, John built his own house. He did everything bar the plumbing. Apparently, legally, he couldn't do the plumbing or he would have done that too. Um, but, you know, he's that sort of guy, very good with his hands. I don't have those skills. But what does that mean? So when there's some chairs to be packed away or a floor to be vacuumed at church or a stage to set up, does that mean, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I, I, don't, I, I, can't, I don't have those skills? No, I just have to get in there and get it done. I might not be excited about doing but it's just stuff that's got to be done. You know, I think of um, Jim Thompson. I was watching him this week. You know, every, every week, almost every week, Jim Thompson, one of our faithful members who's been here forever, Jim goes to the front of our church. We have that beautiful um, artistic work of the big cross and the, the pond underneath it. He cleans it out, gets rid of the leaves, keeps it looking nice every single week. And it's quite a job, takes quite a while. Now, is that because Jim's passionate about collecting leaves? No, it's because he's committed to a task. He wants the church to look attractive as it comes in. You know, or you see someone like Miriam Price. Now, Miriam's our, our bookings manager, and Miriam is quite, you know, she enjoys showing people around and finding the best room for them and sorting out the details of that booking. But when it comes to some of the data entry, which can be pretty tedious, that's not her passion. Or when it comes to sometimes she's got to get in there and help set something up or pack it away because there's no one else to do it, that's not her passion. Why is she doing it? She does it because it's just got to be done. It's a job that has to be done. You see, friends, this is what I see here in these guys. A perfume maker, you know, a goldsmith. No, there they are, lifting big chunky rocks and getting them in position. Why? Because the job had to be done. Not because it was a spiritual gift, it's just stuff that had to be done. Look at uh, Nehemiah 3.12. Shalom, the son of Halohesh the ruler of the half-district of Jer Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. That's an interesting little note there, isn't it, that Nehemiah has decided to record? Um, so you, you've, got, you've got this guy. He's actually a ruler of the half-district of, of Jerusalem. He's a fairly well-to-do chap. And he's got his daughters there. He's, he's, I've got this picture of this young adult girl, probably quite nicely dressed, being he's, he would have been a wealthy man, the half-district of Jerusalem, being the ruler of that. And here's, here's the girls, you know, just like Dad, they're down there, these young adult or teenage girls, and picking up bricks, breaking their fingernails, getting the job done, working as a family. And we see a lot of that in Scripture. What do we learn from this, friends? Well, again, just a good practical application. I believe, where possible, involve family as part of your team. Number five, where possible, involve family 
as part of your team. Now, one of the teams that, you know, that we, we see very much functioning family team stuff going on here regularly is, is the Dormells. We saw Melissa up here earlier giving announcements, our children's pastor. We've got her husband, Andreas. He heads up our media team. That's all the media stuff that goes on in the church. That's a huge job, actually. Or you've got Jared, their son. He's a key player working with Josh for youth, one of their key leaders, puts a lot of energy into that, plays bass and drums as well. Andreas plays drums too. A and then we've got Amy. She's been baptised next week. She's heavily involved in children's ministry. The whole family do ministry together. Or we think of the Papoffs, you know? I mean, you know, we've got Anna's heavily involved in children's ministry, but, you know, they're also, um, you'll see sometimes on the odd Sunday, you see Anna, who's a great singer, actually, so... If I'm leading, I often get her to sing because I like her harmonies. So you see, Anna, Anna's up here singing. You've got Nathan here who broke some pencils before playing keys. And, and you've got um, Dave Papoff, Dad. He's mixing sound, very good mixer. And in this occasion, you've got young Simon up singing as well. You know, they work as a team. Now, it's great to see teamwork coming into the family. We've got a whole family involved in serving the Lord together like this guy, Shalom and his daughters. Have a look at 3.14. The dung gate was repaired by Melchizedek, the son of Rachab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim. He rebuilt it and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. This is an interesting moment. I mean, even the, this guy's name sounds prestigious, doesn't it? Melchizedek, I am Melchizedek, and I come to repair the walls. Yeah, well, mate, uh, we got the dung gate. We can go fix that. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing is, here is this guy who is, he's, again, he's a ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim. Uh, yet, you don't see that stopping him repairing the least prestigious of the gates. Uh, yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's where... Uh, down the bottom of the, of the city of Jerusalem, it's where they take out the garbage, the refuse, out through that gate, and they then burn it in the Hinnon Valley. Um, <laughs> you can imagine the conversations. The job's all done. You know, everything's finished. Uh, Melchizedek, what part of the wall did you repair? Uh, one of the gates down south. Oh, which one? Wh wh which one was it? It's a dung gate. Sorry, sorry, what was it? What, what, which gate was it? Okay, it was the dung gate. It was the dung gate I repaired. Well, you don't see any protest from this guy. He just gets on with the job. It's one of the gates that's got to be fixed. He gets it done. And it does speak of him, especially because he's a ruler. So I think he was a man of humility. He didn't care which gate. I'm just getting the job done. Whatever has to be done. Doesn't matter if it's stinky. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> Number six, I learned this, friends. Humility makes a great team player. Humility makes a great team player. Their focus isn't on themselves, it's on the Lord and his work. Look at Nehemiah 3.20. It says, next to him, Baruch, son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the entrance of the house of Elisha, the high priest. He zealously repaired that section. I tell you what, this wall goes up pretty fast. Nehemiah's management, his motivation of the teams is wonderful. These guys work hard. There's all these teams working very, very hard. The fact that Nehemiah draws attention to Baruch as working with great zeal means this guy must have been insanely passionate about it, really enthusiastic. And uh, friends, I, I want to just suggest we learn from this guy. Number seven, enthusiasm builds team energy. You've got enthusiastic people on your team, it's going to build your team energy. Enthusiasm builds team energy. There's that concept of synergy again. When you've got energy on a team, passion on a team, the whole team works more enthusiastically. Baruch is a good example of this. And what about yourself? You know, do you serve with a measure of zeal, enthusiasm when you're trying to do something here in the church for God? Or do you get a bit grumbly? Oh, do that again. Oh. I'm sure all of us do at times. But let, let's allow someone like Baruch to influence us. Let's see the zeal of this man and think, hey, wouldn't it be good if I could be enthusiastic about what I do for God? 
finally, let's, let me look at a little cluster of verses here. Nehemiah 3.23, it says this, Beyond them, Benjamin and Hassab made repairs in front of their house. Notice that? Where are they making repairs? In front of their house. And next to them, Azariah, son of uh, Meshia and the son of Ananiah, made repairs beside his house. Again, or 28. Above the horse gate, the priests made repairs each in front of his own house. Repairs near the house again. Or Meshulam, the son of Berechai, made repairs opposite his living quarters. In verse 30. What are we seeing? Nehemiah has done some interesting organisation here. Now think about it logically. He could have got people up north to travel down south for a couple of kilometres and repaired some of the wall down there. Or he could cut out all that travelling distance and if they're already living in the city, have them repair portions of the wall right next to where they live. Cuts out all that travel time. It's logical, isn't it? There's another piece of logic about it as well. If there is an invading army... They will usually send out scouts and try and strategically pick which is the weakest part of the wall. So if you're building some wall right in front of your house, you're going to make it as, make sure it's as strong as possible. You don't want to bust in your part of the wall right in front of your home, do you? So another thing that is safeguarded is that the, the quality of the walls would be high. Good strategic stuff. Let me suggest this, you know, um, that uh, getting people in the right places, you know, number eight, position your teams strategically. Number eight, position your teams strategically. Let me quote here a little bit from the NIV Bible commentary. It says, if you are part of a group working on a project, make sure each person sees the importance and the meaning of the job he or she has to do. This will ensure high-quality work and personal satisfaction. Well, let's recap on eight healthy principles here we learn about te teamwork from this chapter. Number one, spiritual leaders should set the example of teamwork. Two, when worship is given priority, teams function better. Three, effective team leaders have realistic expectations. Four, good teamwork may require people to operate outside their area of gifting. Five, where possible, involve family as part of your team. Six, humility makes a great team player. Seven, enthusiasm builds team energy. Eight, position your teams strategically. Now, friends, when we've got uh, people serving in a ministry team, Utilizing the previous eight principles, they will build strong spiritual walls in a local church. Let me say that again. When people serve in ministry teams, utilizing the previous eight principles, they will build strong spiritual walls in their local church. You know, one of the things that uh, I've seen um, from statistics over the years. Um, pastors will often have a look at this sort of information, but apparently when people visit a church and decide, oh, I think I'll start going there, and they come along perhaps for a few months, and then they feel like, mm, nah, I'm not sure if I really fit there, and they drift off and go somewhere else. Well, so often what is happening, and they don't realise this, but there's a psychological thing happening. They haven't found friends. Yeah, of course they're friendly to people after a church service, but they haven't found actual friends. And one of the best ways of connecting with people is serving in a ministry team. So often friendships start, relationships build, and then the church starts to feel like home. You might, yeah, I, I realise you might be saying, yeah, well, Lee, I've been coming for a while, but I wouldn't have a clue how to get involved. I mean, how do you do that? I don't know about what ministries operate here. Well, let me, let me help. Why don't you pluck this out? In your TBC life, there's a bright blue document. Why don't you pluck that out for a moment? Have Cast your eyes over it. Everyone just uh, take a moment, find this in your handout. I've got a list here. 
for quite a few different ministries, not every ministry. And I've just given a little description, just a one-sentence description, just to keep it brief. Have a quick look at this. For instance, we have a whole bunch of different ministries here. For instance, pastoral care, providing care such as a hospital visit, being a listening ear, offering some prayer for a person. For another one, newcomers team, helping visitors settle in by chatting to new people, doing follow-up phone calls, helping with a newcomer's hospitality lunch. Worship ministry, playing a musical instrument, singing, worship leading or providing administration support for the team. Technical support, mixing sound, lighting, PowerPoint, camera, training is always provided for those things. Or evangelism and alpha, helping out with an evangelistic outreach, sharing the gospel with people, assisting when we run an alpha course. Or one-to-one discipleship, meeting regularly with a new believer one-to-one and taking the person through a series of studies, discussing life with them, grounding them in their newfound faith in Jesus. Hospitality, serving and setting up morning tea after a church service. Cooking meals or making desserts and slices for church events. Organising the setup of a room and the presentation of the food. The welcome team. Serving on the welcome team. Handing out TBC Life. Preparing and serving communion, as we had today. Providing a pleasant smile and an encouraging welcome as people walk into the service. Administration. Helping in the administration area. Photocopying, filing, creating flyers and posters and general secretarial work. Children's ministry. At Kids Church, if you want to see an investment grow substantially, then invest in a child's life and join an amazing team of investors, including related to that playgroup, needing those who have a heart for young mums and children and a willingness to serve in our playgroup program. Revolution Youth that we heard about today, equip, encourage and empower our youth in Christ by helping set up, food prep, pack down, befriending and mentoring youth, leading Bible studies and more. Young adults, facilitating Christ-centered community by attending 6 p.m. services, building relationships with young adults and helping with hospitality, tech, set up and pack down. Prayer ministry, joining a prayer meeting, praying for those who come forward after an altar call or putting your name down to be a part of an emailed prayer chain or simply joining one of our existing prayer meetings. We have a new one actually on Thursdays here in this auditorium at 11 o'clock, Thursday 11 o'clock here in the auditorium. Went to the last one, very powerful. Maintenance, maintaining our church facilities and gardens with those skilled in a trade or those who are simply willing to lend a hand, including cleaning. Small group Bible studies, those willing to host or lead a small group Bible study and have the ability to recruit a team of people willing to attend. Now, okay, I ripped through those pretty quickly, all 15 of them. Um, Now, you might be thinking, well, actually one of those did appeal to me. I could be involved in one of them. Uh, well, there's a sign-up sheet at the back. Just pop your name down, let us know your interest. Just put the name of the ministry there, name and a phone number, that's all we need. But we'd love to see the church operating more and more as a team. Not just attending, but becoming a part of the community, become a part of the mission, part of what God is doing here in this place. Let me finish with a story about some geese. What can we learn from God's creation when it comes to geese? Look at them up there. Flapping away. (laughs) We know that V formation that uh, they they fly in. Now apparently, when they're flying in that V formation, being a windbreak one to another to another, they use 75% less energy than if a goose is just flying by himself. Now, friends, the thing is, if we pull together in teamwork more and more, getting that synergy type of effect happening, it means actually we spend less energy getting the job done, something we can learn from them. One more thing about geese and bird life in general that that travel long distances. They take advantage of the wind currents. Apparently, Alaska to New Zealand, which is some 6,800 miles, birds have been tagged which have made that journey in as few as seven days, taking advantage of the existing wind currents. Now, one of the things that we as Christians need to do is take advantage 
of the wind of God's Spirit. What is the Lord doing at any given time? To have a listening ear, a responsive heart to hear what is God doing in this area or in this church right now? How can I catch the wind of God's Spirit and be caught up in that? Well, as the worship team returns, let's close in prayer. Father, here today, one of our desires is indeed not only to see teamwork, but to see Spirit-led teamwork, to see your Holy Spirit operating with us, cooperating with us, working through us, seeing the name of Jesus glorified. And so help us more and more to cooperate with your spirit be moved by your spirit get involved as your spirit leads to work as a team to be involved in seeing synergy happen working with that sense of calling and passion and simply getting in there getting the job done rolling up our sleeves so father help us to be a church of strong spiritual walls a church of real teamwork a church of synergy in the mighty name of Jesus and for His glory. Amen.